When we last left off, Ruby was learning how to be in the spotlight without Stella, and Ivan had just told us that Stella was gone. Five men. Bob heard from a rat, a reliable sort, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. Comfort. All day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good and happy life? That she lived as she was meant to live? That she died with those who loved her most nearby? At least the last part is true. Crying. Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. When George sees Mac, he runs to him. I can only hear a few of his words. Vet, should have, wrong. Mac shrugs. His shoulders droop. He leaves without a word. When George wipes the fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. The one and only Ivan. When all the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay, and I told her not to worry, because you were going to save her. You promised, Stella. Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain, and for a moment it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess. But I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says, mighty silverback. He licks my chin and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time. All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently to get some sleep. Please, for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he is on my stomach. I hear a stirring, Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? Yeah, I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs, and I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins too. I know, I say, because it's all I can think of. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. I scratch the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. Oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for long, horrible minutes. Then I hear myself saying, once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. The grunt. I was born in a place humans call Central Africa in a dense rainforest so beautiful, no crayons could ever do it justice. Gorillas don't name their newborns right away, not the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what they might, might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap onto my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her and we would bounce onto that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. That game never got old although my father might have disagreed. Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark and my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves, I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud, and that's why they called me Mud. 
To a human, mud might not like might not sound like much, but to me it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were ten of us, my father the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females. A juvenile male called a blackback and two other young gorillas. Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then, as families will, but my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. My father was a master at leading us the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nest. He was everything a silverback was meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector, and nobody could chest beat like my father. A perfect life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther and farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult. How to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly, or they will fall apart in the middle of the night. How to beat on your chest, cup your palms, and amplify the sound. How to go vining from tree to tree and don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, and be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. The end. One day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came. Vine. After they captured my sister and me, they put us in a cramped, dark crate, and it smelled of urine and fear. Somehow I knew that in order to live, I had to let my older life my old life die, but my sister could not let go of our home. It held her like a vine, stretching across the miles, comforting, strangling. We were still in our crate when she looked at me without seeing, and I knew that the vine had finally snapped. The temporary human. It was Mac who pried open the, cape, the crate. Mac who bought me, and Mac who raised me like a human baby. I wore diapers, I drank from a bottle, I slept in human beds, sat in human chairs, listened while human words swarmed around me like angry bees. Mac had a wife back then. Helen was quick to laugh, but quick to anger too, especially when I broke something, which was often. Here's what I broke when I lived with Mac and Helen. One crib, 46 glasses, seven lamps, one couch, three shower curtains, three curtain rods, one blender, one TV, one radio, and three toes that were my own. I broke the blender when I, scree when I squeezed three tubes of toothpaste and a bottle of glue in it. I broke my toes attempting to swing from a lamp fixture on the ceiling. I broke 46 glasses. Well, it turns out there are many ways to break glass. Every weekend, Mac and Helen took me to their convertible to a fast food restaurant where they ordered me french fries and a strawberry shake. Mac loved to see the expression on the cashier's face when he drove up. Could I have some extra ketchup for my kid? I went to baseball games, to the grocery store, to the movie, even to the circus. They didn't have a gorilla. I rode a little motorbike and blew out candles on birthday cake. My life as a human was a glamorous one, although my parents, traditional sorts, would not have approved. So I want you to think about, after we've read that, um, discuss the importance of memory in the story. How does Ivan's perception change when he begins to remember more of his story? What are his most vivid memories? What was Ivan's name in the forest? And why do you think it's important for him to remember his name and his life as a baby gorilla?